Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. And Mr. Mayor, welcome. We always like to see you here up in Albany and uh, appreciate you taking the time to come up, especially when there's so much going on in the city. Um, and my congratulations to all that you did. And, and uh, I know there are still some problems out there, but for the size of that snow, you guys did a tremendous job. And the city workers in New York, they're the best. They really are. Amen. Thank you. Listen. You have identified over the years um, housing, affordable housing, as a major priority. Where do we stand on that? Um, how many units to date have we uh, produced? Uh, Assemblyman, we're very proud to say our plan, uh, because it's 200,000 units preserved or built over 10 years, basically the average we hope for each year is 20,000 uh, per year. Uh, we now have 41,000 plus units that have either been already preserved or built, or at least the financing has been secured formally, uh, and those are under contract. So 41,000 units now having been achieved over the first two years. We had the expiration of um, the 421A, okay. Um, any views on how that is going to affect your housing plan? But first, I want to say we believe fundamentally uh, that uh, 421A needed change. It had to be a program that was more fair to the taxpayers. Uh, it had to be a program that did not uh, focus so many resources on luxury housing. In fact, the reason for 421A, in my view, now has to be the creation of affordable housing on a much greater level. So it was profoundly important to get a different approach. Uh, obviously, I'm very disappointed that uh, a plan was not agreed upon in recent days. I think we have to get to work, all of us together, uh, in finding a way to move forward quickly uh, that recognizes these key criteria. Whatever is done going forward must do more to support the creation of affordable housing, must be more fair to the taxpayers, and should not uh, reward luxury housing in the way the previous plan did. Thank you. Um, design build has been used for several projects throughout the state of New York. Um, Tappan Zee Bridge, I know the, uh, the MTA uh, has been using it for their projects in Penn Station and Jarvis Center. Um, I've been speaking over the past year and a half or so with Commissioner Trottenberg, who is a ardent advocate of uh, the design build and for some of the products that the Department of Transportation is producing. Um, where are we standing with that? And, and how are we, are we going to come to an agreement with maybe some of the union sector here to make them uh, you know, jump on board with this? Well, Samuel, first of all, I appreciate your focus on it. It's uh, not what we call a sexy issue, but it is an issue that really matters in terms of what we do every day in the city. Uh, you're right that uh, Commissioner Trottenberg is an ardent advocate for uh, this uh, improvement. Uh, she is matched in that ardent feeling by uh, Sharif Solomon, uh, so I'm going to ask him to speak to the specifics of this issue. Sure. Um, thank you for your leadership on that issue, of course. We've worked closely on that. Um, we would like to have that procurement method extended to New York City, as you know. The mayor mentioned two major projects in New York City that could really benefit from design build. We have the BQE project and we have the Belt Parkway, just to give two examples. In the city, we've done great work to um, get the building trades on board and also to get uh, DC 37 on board. So we have labor support in New York City. We look forward to working with you and your colleagues to, uh, uh, to have it adopted this year. It would be. Um quite helpful if we would get some memos of support from the unions you mentioned. Um, I have never seen them. I would like to see them to show my colleagues that we do have uh, union support for this. Um, right now, many of them are doubtful, and I re really would be remiss if I didn't mention my colleague, uh, Robert Rodriguez, who's yeah. very interested in this and chairs our subcommittee uh, uh, on uh, infrastructure. Okay, so we can join in and maybe move ahead on this. Be happy to get you those. Good, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.
Thank you. Senator. Thank you very much. And I'd like to welcome the mayor to Albany. It's good to see you. And I do have a series of information and, and questions for you. Um, so you went through your testimony, and I listened to it very carefully. And you did point out there's some good things in the budget that you agreed with. But you also brought in a litany of complaints, things like Medicaid, CUNY, charter schools, transportation, capital, and the list goes on. And basically what you're saying is that you're demanding more money from the state's taxpayers that you want more money. This year's budget proposal is a $322 million net positive for New York City, including $364 million in growth for school aid. And other investments also being made under this proposal, including the areas of housing, which you know I have particular uh, interest in, homeless programs, economic development, and transportation. So I'd like to go through some of the areas that you covered in your testimony. And I'd like to start with Medicaid. The, spa the state actually spends total $18.5 billion on the Medicaid program, and almost $12 billion of those funds go to New York City. We, as the legislature and the governor, has capped the growth of Medicaid to help local governments around the state. And they have to live within the constraints of the property tax cap, but the property tax cap does not apply to New York City. That's correct, right? So this year, New York City is collecting $3.5 billion more in property taxes than if it had the 2% property tax cap. So the mandate relief is going, I believe, in the wrong place, and the city clearly has the resources to pay a share of the Medicaid annual growth. And here are the numbers over the long term. Medicaid is expected to grow about 4.5%. We take actions to control costs and get the growth down to within our own Medicaid spending cap. This year it's about 3.5%. And I think what the budget is asking is for the city to share in a little bit of the growth, but still not as much as what we pay in our counties around the state. The state is capping New York City's growth at 2%, and the state will continue to pay any growth above 2%. And by the way, not coincidentally, 2% is the limit of the property tax cap. So we're living, with under, we're living under constraint of property tax cap upstate. You don't have that constraint. And as a result, some of the poorest counties would be subsidizing people on Medicaid in New York City. And we have very poor counties upstate. So I, that's just wrong. So even after these proposals, the budget will still provide $631 million in mandate relief from the Medicaid program to New York City. And that, I may point out, is still more than last year. So I assume that you would prefer this year's budget over last year's budget because of $631 million in mandate relief. Well, uh, first of all, Chair, I want to thank you for the fact that we've obviously been in uh, a close working partnership with you on housing issues. I know it is your, your passion and uh, want to thank you for the work we've done together. Thank you. On the questions you're raising now, I think it's important to start by saying uh, I've had uh, perhaps a different experience than some people who have held this particular role in that I spent a part of my career working on the concerns of upstate as well and different parts of the state when I was the HUD regional director. And all of New York State was part of the area uh, that I worked on during the Clinton administration. So I spent a lot of time in big cities and smaller cities and towns all over this state and I absolutely understand that many parts of our state are struggling economically, just like the, uh, you know, the 46 percent of New York City residents who are at or near the poverty level. So we have challenges all around. Um, I would argue that it would be very good in all of our discussion about this state, of course, to think like one state, to think about the needs of every type of New Yorker and what we can do to maximize economic growth for all of us, uh, for the good of all. I do think it's fair to say that New York City uh, right now is uh, providing a very positive impact on the rest of the state, economically and in terms of revenue. Uh, we're proud of that fact. What I'm trying to do in my budget is keep that going for all of us, to keep building our economy for the good of all residents of New York State. 
Uh, to do that, we have to have fiscal stability. Uh, the investments we're making in more police, for example, in improving our schools uh, and keeping the housing affordable is also about our economic viability for the long haul. So I do think we're all interrelated deeply and uh, our ability uh, to succeed affects everyone else and everyone else's reality affects us. Now, what I would argue here is because of what's happened in recent decades, we all know that if there is a downturn, God forbid, but we all know enough about economics to say it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. <coughs> in the context of any downturn, there will be a very severe impact on our budgetary dynamic because it will start above us at the federal and state level. In a downturn, your revenues will be reduced, federal revenues will be reduced, and of course there'll be less for New York City, and then our own revenues go down. The reason I say this, in these scenarios, there is no safety net for us. There is no ability to turn to you and say, can you help us out in a jam? We'll know that you're not in a position to do that. So we have to have reserves, and we have to have fiscal stability. What I mentioned to you just between the change from our actuary and the immediate cost that we had to pay directly to address the problem of health and hospitals, that's a billion dollars more in the current fiscal year's budget that was absolutely unforeseen a year ago. So uh, I would argue to you that uh, fairness from our point of view is to continue uh, the state taking on responsibilities it has vis-a-vis -vis Medicaid uh, to help us ensure our fiscal stability for the good of all, but also with the recognition that in the event that there is a major financial challenge ahead, Thank that you we're much. in a position to handle it. Thank you, Mayor, for that, that answer. But um, as I pointed out, there's still $631 million in mandate relief savings under Medicaid for New York City, and that's more than last year. I'd like to switch to CUNY because, as we know, CUNY stands for the City University of New York. And 71% of the students who go to CUNY are from the city, but the entire bill for the CUNY system is picked up by the taxpayers of New York State. That was a temporary arrangement and dates back to a time when New York City was in fiscal crisis and they could not afford CUNY. State stepped in and saved the CUNY system. Now the city has the resources, and we'll go over that in a few minutes about what your um, surplus is, to resume the support of CUNY. And the real question is, at what level? So under the current structure, the city appoints 30% of the CUNY Board of Trustees, and under the budget, 30% of the cost uh, we believe would be reasonable. So even though 70% of the CUNY students are from the city, state taxpayers will continue to pay for 70% of the operating costs. And in addition, the state expects to spend about $2.5 billion over the next five years on CUNY capital projects, which I think is very good. CUNY's capital program represents about 20% of all New York City construction today, so this state investment is huge for the New York City economy. Um, so, so this, you know, this, under the CUNY part of the proposal, still are making out. Last year, the city had such a big surplus that you prepaid $3.6 billion of this year's expenses and put billions in reserves. And you just talked about why you want to do that. Each year, the city recognizes billions in additional revenue over its four-year financial plan that you did not include when the budget was first adopted. And last year, that number was $11 billion. Right now, the city's fiscal watchdogs are projecting up, upwards of $2.5 billion in additional revenues for the city's upcoming budget. Um, so you talked about the need to be fiscally prudent and squirrel, squirrel away money, but the question is, you have this enormous surplus, and do you have a PEG program in place, which is a program to eliminate the gap New York City agencies look for savings, looks for cuts. Um, okay. Do you have that in place? Let me speak. You, you raised several points, if I may. I'll try and speak to each of them quickly. Um, first of all, we do contribute substantially to CUNY, and we have, and I want uh, in a moment Dean Fulahan to outline that to you. Um, second, we believe that our contribution is consistent uh, with uh, what is uh, 
our obligation in terms of the history and certainly when it compares favorably to what's being done in other parts of the state. Um, the fact is that we know, and I'll use a fact from the last economic downturn, when the Great Recession hit, the combined impact of lost federal and state aid uh, and uh, the cuts that were necessary in New York City and the tax increases that were necessary in New York City totaled about $12 billion over two years. Against that backdrop, we have laid in very heavy reserves, again, knowing with absolute respect that neither the state nor federal government will be in a position to come to our aid in that kind of scenario. I think it's a fair statement to say that New York City's ability to continue being an uh, economic engine is of paramount strategic importance to the whole state. So we must maintain that stability. I don't think anyone here wants to see New York City slip backwards economically. And that's why we are so focused on these reserves. Uh, Dean Fulham will give you a little more of our view of why we think what we're already contributing to CUNY is both substantial and fair. So the takeover by the state of CUNY was actually a permanent takeover. It was similar to the senior college operations of the state university. The community colleges, we do contribute a third of everything that goes into the operations and a half of the capital budget of the community colleges, which is actually the exact same model that is used throughout the state. As a matter of fact, we are the only municipality that actually doesn't have a majority of the board of trustees of their local community college. So it's so community colleges versus the CUNY them. system, right? That's correct. The community okay. college is the model that's used throughout the state. It is the model that was adopted during the fiscal crisis in 1976 when the, uh, when the CUNY senior colleges were taken over and the board of trustees also the Right, and as you point out, that's the same system that's also, across the entire state for community colleges the community colleges, which does not exist in your county, where the majority is actually at the local part, even though they also pay the one-third part. Uh, I would just also like to go back uh, quickly um, on the Medicaid part. I, just worth noting one more additional thing that the mayor pointed out to emphasize that we actually have no, uh, between the between 2005 reform on Medicaid and the 2012 action on Medicaid, the state has completely taken over the entire administration and rate setting of Medicaid, including, including additional powers to actually set and control the very percentages that you are talking about. So we have no role in this other than the five to six billion dollars that you're talking about that we contribute in. But you're still getting substantial savings under this budget and mandate relief, and you don't have the constraints and of the 2% property tax cap that all the other counties in the state have to live under, correct? We pay uh, income tax, too, though. Right. So, Starcy, MAC bonds, there's, um, the state is committed to paying 100% of the debt service related to the Starcy bonds, and that's going forward. And when the bonds were refinanced, there were savings. And also I want to point out state taxpayers will pay 100% of the $4.8 billion for the city's MAC bonds. And state taxpayers deserve every dollar of the savings. This should be obvious. Um, it's like if your uncle pays the mortgage on your house when you refinance your house, who deserves the savings? I, did, uh, I do want to go back, though, because we talked about you have nearly $5 billion in reserves, including $3.4 billion in retiree health benefits trust. $1 billion annually in your general reserve, which is an historically high level, $500 million in new capital stabilization reserve. You're benefiting from not having the property tax cap. You have uh, upwards of $2.5 billion in potential additional revenues for the city's upcoming budget. So you're in a very, very good spot. But I did want to point out with your spending, because you are outpacing the state's fiscal restraint as you know, we are under a voluntary 2% spending cap through the state budget. And however, the city's expenditures have increased at an average annual rate of more than 6%. And from 2011 to 16, city-funded expenditures adjusted for surplus transfers 
have grown at an average annual rate of 6.33%, as a matter of fact, and you compare that to the state spending of less than 2%. So you're in a great spot financially because you have all these surplus dollars, you're increasing spending over 6%. And again, I wanted to ask, because I asked it previously, I'm not sure I got the answer to it, but are you looking at your spending? Are you doing anything with the program to eliminate the gap called the PEG program with your city agencies to try to restrain some of the spending um, and find some savings? for the taxpayers of New York City? Okay, Senator, I, let me go over several points that you raised, if I may. Uh, first, on that point, uh, we, uh, Mr. Fulham can outline the details. We had over a billion dollars of savings that we identified in our preliminary budget proposal. Uh, we also have said very clearly, we are looking seriously at a specific PEG strategy for the executive budget proposal in May. But not a minor matter that we found a billion dollars in savings already. Uh, second, some of the growth, a substantial amount of the growth in the budget is related to uh, Hurricane Sandy matters, meaning uh, we are passing through uh, federal dollars from FEMA, from HUD, uh, for Hurricane Sandy relief efforts. That is a temporary condition. When those federal dollars drop up, we anticipate that our budget will actually contract. Uh, we also, as you, uh, as you heard earlier, have brand new obligations that came on very suddenly that we are, uh, by law, must uh, abide by, obviously, in the case of the city actuary, adding a $600 million charge for this year and every year thereafter. We have an immediate challenge related to health and hospitals. So that budgetary growth is in large measure because of federal funds that are short-term and because of new obligations that we have no choice but to meet. On your other questions, uh, or the other points you made, on the um, on the way our tax system is oriented in the city, obviously one of the few places in the state with a personal income tax at the city level. I would say my colleagues here from the city would agree that our property tax rate plus our city uh, income tax is certainly uh, substantial uh, for our taxpayers to have to handle. Um, finally, on the question of the $600 million on the, on the MAC refinancing, uh, this issue, we believe fundamentally, was settled in 2004 by the New York State Court of Appeals, which made clear that the state had an obligation through 2034, I believe it was, to continue a regular payment of $170 million per year to the city of New York. It was an agreement struck between the two levels of government. It was confirmed by the Court of Appeals. So we believe that has to be honored for the long term. Thank you, Mayor, for those answers. You know, the bottom line is that um, the city is awash in money right now, and localities around the state, counties, cities, small cities, villages, towns, um, would only dream of having surpluses and have to live under the property tax cap. So I want to thank you for your answers. And uh, I'm sorry, Senator, could we just do a quick response to that last point, please? Sure. Right. Thank you. I, I just want to quickly add, the mayor talked about over a billion dollars in the preliminary budget with more savings to be found in the executive budget. And last year, we did over a billion four also in savings. PEG really is a plan to eliminate the gap, which the city has, and it's worth noting that in 18 we are projecting a $2.2 billion gap, and in 19 a $2.9 billion gap, and in 20 a $2.7 billion gap. Thank you very so much. We also, and the prepayments happens to be under the accounting methods that the city uses, that's how we actually balanced, and those prepayments you talked about are exactly how we proposed in the preliminary budget a balanced budget for fiscal 17. And finally, the Medicaid challenges that you raise, it, let's be clear, our situation with our Health and Hospitals Corporation is only going to get more difficult because of larger things happening in federal and state policy. We would very much like to work with the state uh, and join with the state in going to Washington for some of the fundamental changes we'll need. But in the meantime, the financial impact on the city will grow intensely. And again, we don't have a safety net to turn to. We will simply have to take on those costs. So I would just suggest that that's a, another challenge that will grow for us. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. We've been joined by Assemblyman Buckwall and Assemblyman Scoofus. And Next this, question. And this Assemblyman Friend. Next is Assemblyman Cusick. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for, for being up here in Albany. It's uh, always good to see you. Uh, and it's good that you brought uh, the guy next, both guys next to you, uh, Dean Fulan and uh, Sharif Solomon, both uh, alum of the State Assembly. It's good to see all of you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to follow up on some of the uh, discussions that were happening before. Uh, there, there was talk uh, about the property tax cap uh, and the uh, reference that New York City does not have the property tax cap. What is the feeling of the administration on that? I know there is legislation out there uh, to have a property tax cap. We talk about affordable housing. Uh, I come from an area that it's ma uh, majority of the folks are homeowners uh, and taxes in general are an issue. Uh, I know this topic has come up many times. Sure. Could, could you just uh, give us Yes. A I'm a homeowner myself in Brooklyn and the district I represent in the city council was overwhelmingly an outer borough homeowner district, so I certainly can relate to the concerns that so many of my constituents have. Uh, we do not believe in a property tax cap, and it gets right back to the point that there are three levels of government, and uh, maybe in the 1970s, when uh, the sense of the relationship between those levels of government was different, and certainly when the federal government had a very different sense of its own obligations and its role, uh, we could assume that in any time of danger, uh, we could turn elsewhere. We have no such illusion at this point in history. So we can't put any artificial uh, barrier in place that might undermine our ability to serve our people and protect our economy and protect the safety of our people. I, I look at this in a very, uh, cold-eyed way. We have to protect uh, the day-to-day -day life of everyday New Yorkers, the quality of life, the safety. And the investments we're making are about protecting our long-term economic health. We certainly saw what happened in the 1960s and 70s when the city was not fiscally disciplined and did not make the right investments and became less economically viable. We saw the huge domino effect that occurred. We're not going to let that happen, and part of that revolves around making sure that we have the revenue we need to make the investments that will protect everyone's best interests. So we do not believe in a cap. We also know, as I mentioned, the latest figures, again, very sadly, 46 percent of New Yorkers at or near the poverty level. It's an astounding figure uh, for us to be able to help people uh, be viable and sustainable. Uh, we have to make sure that we have resources available. Uh, so in the end, I think this is the prudent long-term path for our city. Well, ag again, and uh, I appreciate what you have to go through in, in balancing a, a budget as large as New York City, uh, but I know in the outer boroughs, particularly in Staten Island, uh, taxes are, are v a very big part of people's lives, uh, and it's probably the number one complaint that we get uh, as elected officials, uh, and we need to address something when it comes to the uh, property taxes. Uh, on the tax cap, my only suggestion is, is that the issue with a lot of residents is the predictability, and, and they know that there is not going to be an increase or, or anything like that, whereas right now there's no predictability. Uh, people have to wonder if there's going to be an increase. Uh, and these are things that I, I think is very important to all residents of New York City. 